My name is Torsten Schmidt and I had the privilege to be amongst the people that founded a thing called the Red Bull Music Academy in a different millennium. Oh, <laughs> yes. And um, <laughs> actually we are here today because what we do a lot is speak to people because we want to hear their stories, what they experienced and what we can learn from them. And it is with uttermost pleasure that um, I'd like you to welcome a person that I personally learned a fair bit from, <laughs> um, introducing the original first lady of German <laughs> bass, DJ Storm. Hello, everyone. <laughs> well, it's nice to be back. And I was at the first Red Bull Music Academy, wasn't that I? I? Yeah, that is yeah, true yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. Chemistry and Storm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just down the road, actually. Wow, not that big house. <laughs> yeah, not too, not too <laughs> far away in Friedrichshain. Um, yeah, that was a little different, but not that much has changed. I mean, the book is still there. Um, there's <laughs> stacks and like, yeah. Studios kind of change. <laughs> they kind of do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, and I, but, you know, uh, what was lovely about that was we met two of our heroes, me and Cammy. We met John Aquaviva and Richie Horton. And right. that was fantastic. Yeah, so thank you for that. <laughs> so in which regard were they a hero to you guys? Well, we night? sat there sitting with them and Richie Horton started getting angry, uh, saying, sorry, John Aquaviva started getting angry, said he was so annoyed when people came with their vinyl and they didn't check the Technics at the back and then they wondered why things started jumping and so on. So, um, yeah, it was interesting and me and Kemi came out and we were like, oh, John Aquaviva's our hero. <laughs> um, probably you introduced the person that's sadly not here with us, but um, as the Persians would say, their space is open. Absolutely. Um, who's this Kemi person or who was she to you? So um, Kemi was my DJ partner. I mean, we were friends for years before we um, kind of, you know, because we decided to do it, become DJs. And then um, I moved away to train in Oxford to become a therapeutic radiographer. And she moved to Sheffield, up kind of north part of England. Her boyfriend had been um, employed by this. He was one of the first graphic design companies that ever was set up in Sheffield. And she went up there and she was doing makeup artist kind of work. And then she worked for um, a little lone guy called Jarvis Cocker. She worked for his kind of label, Fon Records. And she happened to move down to London about two weeks before I qualified and I needed a place to stay so I could do, go and do some work placement. So she said, well, look, I'm living in this big Victorian house. The bedroom is massive. We'll just buy another little mattress and come and live with me and we'll share the rent. So, um, you know, then she'd be going out to all these kind of, I don't know what she was going out to and she'd be coming back and sitting on her bed and singing tunes and laughing. And I was like, where are you going? She said, oh, I've discovered this thing called raving. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, and I'm, I just come from Oxford, come on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, electronic music, it's not really for me. And, you know, and she said, oh, no, you need to hear it. So she bombarded me with every pirate radio station that you possibly could. So now my life was full of, I suppose we called it hardcore then. And um, me and my other friend, Nikki, my friend Nikki was a radiographer as well. And uh, we decided, okay, let's go and see what this raving's all about, you know, because we actually really realized that we were really loving the music. And um, so I became the driver for her and her big crew from Red or Dead, They're, they, she, it was a shoe shop. And um, the guy there who was like the manager, he would decide every week where they would go. They'd find a new place to rave or something would happen. And so I became their driver and um, I would drive them in a big vehicle. We'd hire a big vehicle and I'd take them and we'd basically watch them raving, do you know what I mean? And listen to the music and realized, you know, we started enjoying it as well. And um, then um, I think it was, mm, it was 1989 going into, yeah, it was nine, the end of 1989. And the manager of the Red or Dead had heard that there were these two DJs in this club called Heaven that had been brought from upstairs, downstairs. And they were so good that they made all the girls take their tops off. So, of course, the guys wanted to go to this place, and we just went along for the ride, basically. Which was basically a gay club, though. Rage. Well, uh, Rage was basically oh, a gay yeah, club. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, I think it was Kit Kat Club before, and that, w yeah, that was kind of known as a gay club. And the guy running it was, was, was a gay guy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so the first time we went down there, you had to go through all this rigmarole of membership, and we only got to hear this guy who we'd heard once before called Groove Rider. 
and we realised that we really, really liked this guy. And when it came to New Year's Eve that year, we couldn't find a rave to get into, so we were going to go home, and I was at the petrol station filling up my car. And these guys say, where are you going? We said, oh, well, we've tried this rave, we can't get in, we didn't buy tickets, we didn't think about it. He said, don't worry. He said, there's an illegal rave in this Panasonic warehouse in Slough. He said, follow us. So off we went, and we heard Carl Cox and... Gosh, lots of Paul Oakenfold and lots of big people that night. But the one guy that really stood out for us was this guy called Groove Rider. Now, I suppose their story at that time was that you weren't supposed to mix house with acid or mix house with techno. But they liked it. And they said, well, you know, and Carl Cox was like, it'll never work. You know? <laughs> so they liked it. We got turned by, on by that. And as... Growing up in, in the time that Kemi and I grew up, we were always vinyl junkies. We, Kemi and I's, our vinyl collection was vast already. So we started buying the stuff. So I suppose in 1990, we went on a year of really, really hard raving. And we were at um, Ice Valley uh, Ice Rink in Lee, Lee Bridge. And... Um, uh, about, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, I, decide, I, I was listening to these two tunes and I was thinking, we've got these two tunes and they're not, they're not the same speed, yet this guy is making them the same speed. I don't really understand. So I kind of migrated towards the decks and I was looking at this deck with the red light on. I'd never seen it before. And this guy was doing this. And I was like, well, what's he doing? So I, this guy next to me, I said, What's going on there? He said, oh, yes, yeah, a Technics, you know, it's called a Technics. And, you know, it's got a pitch bend and, you know, they're mixing. And we were like, right. And as I looked across the other side of the decks, there was Kemi doing exactly the same. So we came out that night and we said, OK, we obviously want to be with this music 24-7. Let's become DJs. And I suppose that's how it started, really, for us. We, I mean, <laughs> we didn't really engage in the world for about six months at one point and I remember coming down uh, downstairs and our landlady said do you realize we're going to war with Iraq and we were like really oh we didn't know we're just raving <laughs> you know we just we just kind of the we our obsession was there so we had to do something about it now and so we started now making a fund for the decks and I managed to get a job in a private hospital which was kind of three times as much money as I was earning for the NHS so now we had a really nice vinyl fund you know what I mean and um, yeah then uh, Kemi was at work one day in Camden and um, she this guy had come in the shop and uh, she said this really strange guy came in the shop today and he got gold teeth and I was like how do you mean she said well like the whole thing you know like gold you know what I mean and he's asked me to come and do a photo shoot at his house tonight at eight o'clock I said eight o'clock I said, that's like a date, right? And she said, oh, I don't know, but pick me up at 12, yeah? Don't leave me there. And I said, okay. You know, so she tells me now he's this graffiti artist and she had to pretty much lay down the law to him to say, well, look, I think for the next few years I'm going to be quite selfish. I'm into this thing called hardcore. I want to become a DJ and I think I'm not going to have too much time, you know, for relationships or, you know, I think it's going to be quite, I'm going to have to make most probably a lot of sacrifices and, you know, but if you want to come along and hear this music, fine. So we took him to Rage and he wouldn't, he'd just come from his art exhibition. That's why he kind of came back to England because he was had this big graffiti art exhibition and this film had been done about him called Bombing. And um, he was getting a little bit kind of, there was a lot of notoriety about him. And we didn't, we were a bit clueless really, because we weren't into hip hop and we weren't into graffiti at all. We were just into this raving thing, you know? So anyway, he came to Rage and um, he wouldn't come downstairs to hear Groove Rider and Fabio. And we were, we were quite disappointed in him really. We were like, what's your problem? And he was like, what happened? You know, there's black people and Chinese people and Indian people and we, and we were like, you know, what, what are you on about? He said, well, I'm from Miami where there's a black club, there's a Hispanic club, there's a white club, and we don't, you know, we were like, okay, you missed the summer of love where we all came together raving in fields and we became quite anti-establishment because they wanted to stop us dancing, they wanted to stop us enjoying music, and we kind of, you know, didn't want that to happen. So I suppose as a scene, this hardcore scene had become quite, yeah, I suppose anti-establishment really, and... We just wanted to do our thing and we didn't really care about the government, you know. So we'd all come together and it didn't matter where you were from, what you looked like, what you wore. We were all joined by music. I mean, in Rage, really, only people really said to you, tune. And you're like, yeah, 
and carry on raving. You didn't really, there was no last dance. There was no snogging in the corner. You know what I mean? It was just people really loving music and coming together with music. So it was quite a different thing at the time. And the second time we took Goldie, we made him come down. Now he'd realized and that was it. We came home that night and he said, right, I want to make this music. I'm going to become a producer. You two are going to play it. You know, we're going to have a lifestyle kind of label like Stussy. I can do artwork and, you know, so, and I suppose for the next few years, we really did just live that dream. And of course, I suppose him running up on the stage for a very famous record label at that time, Reinforced Records, who had this big hit out called Mr. Kirk's Nightmares. He ran on stage right in the middle of their set and we were mortified. But actually, it changed our lives, really, because they took us on board. We had to kind of get mixing really quickly. And I mean, another thing was that we didn't have a lot of money at that time. But when Goldie got signed, he bought us our decks. We'd had a fund. I think we'd got it up to about £250. So we most probably could nearly afford half of one deck. Um, and we came home one day and he'd bought us our decks. So um, we didn't really know what to do with them. And, you know, a couple of days later when Randall came around and watched us have a little mix and he said it might be easier if you take the rubber mm. kind of thing off. So, yeah, it was quite embarrassing, really. But <laughs> that's how we started, really, me and Kemi. And um, we made a series of tapes that um, I know a lot of people were making tapes at that time, but we decided to have a CV. And Goldie wrote it all in Wild Starling, and he gave me a piece, gave us a piece of artwork to put on the tape. And um, my boyfriend worked <laughs> at um, his father's company where they had lots of artwork situations. So him and Goldie would break in at night and copy our tape covers for free. <laughs> yeah, by any means necessary. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's how Chemistry and Storm were born. I mean, Kemi's name was easy to come by. And we spent a lot of time thinking about mine. We had lots of different thoughts, deck jammer, sidewinder, mix matcher, and you know, and then... So basically every crime rave there ever was. <laughs> exactly. And then my friend said to me, oh, you've got quite a stormy nature. So we were like, chemistry and stormy? We were like, oh no, chemistry and storm. And the other thing about that was, I suppose we didn't want to show that we were women. We just wanted a name that seemed kind of unisex. I mean, not that... <coughs> we were feeling any kind of oppression being women, but we could see that there was only really one female DJ out there, was DJ Rap. And um, yeah, like I say, we were incredibly lucky um, to be picked up by Reinforced, and we'd got a pirate radio show something like three months after getting the decks. So we just had to practice and practice and practice, and it was a graveyard shift, um, six till nine on a Sunday morning. You had to go take your decks and put your decks through this hole that would just, kind of fit and you know then you the next dj would come and bring their decks and there and you take all your decks out and you know it really was pretty underground and and i think you really if you're going to go to those lengths you know that you really want it and i think then chemistry and storm started getting a little bit of notoriety and obviously goldie started making tunes with reinforced and you know people just used to say to us do you know that crazy guy from wolverhampton with the gold teeth and we'd be like no <laughs> <laughs> who is he you know what I mean and then obviously re people realized he was with Kemi and and I suppose because Goldie had that different confidence of us and I do think that's definitely something I've learned over the years as a, as a woman that um, guys tend to have that bit more confidence than us and they go right I'm going to do it something let's do it whereas I think women we think about it a little bit more maybe you can overthink things and I think so we learned a lot by kind of looking at how the guys were and how they got work and we would watch our friend Randall and you know he talked to the promoter and we were like okay we can do this but I have to say we did get a lot of work off those promotional tapes and then we'd turn up like oh you're women and we were like yeah and they were like well can't change it now <laughs> but once we and I mean that's the thing that people want to see I suppose from a woman DJ as opposed to a guy DJ especially when it was quite a novelty then that we can do the job and I think that was the thing about us we were always able to do the job we'd got our skills together and people started to say you've kind of got a style you needed a style then because it was all about you had the DJ here and the producer here and the producer provided the music and the DJ played the music. So there was no producer DJ back at that time. It was just really pure DJs and skills were really important and having a style and people started to say, oh, you've got this kind of rough with the smooth kind of vibe going on. So now we had a style and once we'd kind of, 
yeah, we had quite a few kind of warm-up sets and, you know, our first residency, it took us six months to get into the next position of not warm-up, but that's the best kind of grounding you can ever get, I think, is, is being a warm-up because if you can... There's not many people there at the beginning of a dance, but if you can make them stay and start to get them to dance, then you've done your job as a warm-up. And once you become a good warm-up DJ, then you can start to progress and hopefully the promoter will come and listen to you. Not always, but back in the day, we had some very good promoters that were, would listen to our tapes and would give us advice about what to do, which I don't, I'm not sure is around now. But then it was, you know, kind of, it was kind of important to us, you know. So we had residencies and slowly, slowly we started to get noticed. And yeah, you've got to say that, yeah, maybe we did look a little bit different. You know, one black, one white. She's got the blonde dreadlocks. I've got the dark hair. So I think people kind of were a bit curious about us. You know, like, what are they going to be like? You know what I mean? And yes, we only got half the money each because we were a unit as Chemistry and Storm, like Randall is a unit on his own. But that didn't really bother us. And then obviously Goldie started the label and we started to run that with him. And that was, yeah, amazing. <laughs> but on the up note, you always had a travel companion. And of course. I have to say now, after all these years and doing a lot of talks in the last year about being a female... I'm not sure if I'd have found that e it that easy on my own. We always had each other, and when there was problems, you always had someone to talk to, you know, so we could work it out together. I think we were quite blinkered as to being women because we were just doing our thing. We didn't really kind of stop ourselves, and, yeah, we were lucky to get picked up by Reinforced. It was the hottest label, but once they booked us, then we had to deliver the goods, if you get my drift. So even though it was scary, and I'm always still a bit nervous now when I play, I think I would worry if I didn't, if I wasn't a little bit nervous. But yeah, I mean, we were, yeah, some of the gigs we got, it was proper panting and sitting in the car and, you know, and oh, are we going to be okay? And, you know, you could turn to the other one and, and yeah, it, it was easier. I have to say it was easier having the two of us rather than just the one of us. But I suppose... Since Kemi's passing, I've lived that being on my own again because I did have to kind of reinvent my career after she passed. You know, there was work pending, but a lot of people did cancel the work because I think they always thought that I was maybe, I don't know, a lot of people said, you know, they didn't want to see me upset and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I suppose that's a difficult one because if you met Kemi, as you know, she was a really, you know, she was a really unique individual and she had a certain... I don't know, there was a certain glow about her. There was a certain goldenness about her. And she was, I think she had a really old head on her shoulders almost. You know, she was very wise. And I was always the go-getter, the real confidence. And I think we were very yin and yang with, with each other. And that really worked. So after she'd gone, it took me, a, you know, a while to, can I do this on my own? And of course, we shared one set of records. And we never played each other's records. You know, if I, there was one Dillinger 12... She would choose one side and I would choose the other. And when we were going to cut stuff, you know, dub plates, I would know, I would bring some stuff home for her and say, oh, I'll cut three tracks for you. And she would do the same. We kind of knew. And I don't know how we knew, but we did. So my first gig back, obviously, after she passed, I had to play her records, which was really bizarre because we'd never done that, you know. But I had a lot of support from the scene, I have to say. And, you know, a certain guy called Brian G just basically said, well, this is where you you know, you decide you really want this, you know what I mean? And and boy, would she be angry if you just gave it up. And I said, yes, she come and haunt me and fling things at me, maybe dub plates or something, you know? They're quite painful, you know? <laughs> you don't want to be slapped with a dub no. plate. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly. Um, nevertheless, I mean, it's something that gets rarely talked about because everyone wants to be on a cover of a magazine or uh, on the cover, on the front <coughs> loading page of whatever blog and get gazillion likes and this and that but at the end of the night you're going home alone most of the time yeah. and you're there and if you're playing multiple gigs at night you have to always get yourself back into that zone of being center stage yeah and then be like a very on your own kind of person yeah yeah well i think we realized you know straight away that you know being a dj is about being a performer as i mean you know our first few gigs i'd love to see some pictures of us because we couldn't look up for love or money and um 
you know, it takes a while to finally look up at the crowd and make eye contact. You know, you're just, all you know when you've, you know, okay, so you're at home and you have your radio show, but that's very controlled and, and, and you've got no one around you looking at you. But then when you get out on stage, there are people looking at you and then what happens is people want to come and ask you questions. And you're like, oh, okay, you know, I've got to answer questions now, <laughs> you know. And I think that was, again, easy because there was two of us. And I think we, one of us was always fair game because one of us was always standing. So I think a lot of people found us quite easy to get along with because you could just come and ask us questions and we would tell you. You know, we weren't precious like certain DJs that wouldn't put the name of the track on a dub plate. And when we started to run Metalheads, well, we're trying to sell this stuff. So we've got the name of the artist and we'll tell you when it's coming out because we're gonna release it. We know what the schedule is, you know what I mean? But you start to realize that then actually, yes, for that time you're booked, you're the performer, you're the entertainment. And I think there was that moment there where the DJ kind of became the new live act. You know, there wasn't so many live acts around and it was all about the DJ. And obviously you had your big people like your Oakham Folds and, and Pete Tong and you know that was I think much more of a performance than we were doing on the drum and bass scene but actually once you start to engage with the crowd you see those people with their smiling faces feeling exactly as you're feeling and that's a great feeling because now you know you're able to transmit what you're trying to say through music and people always used to say to me and Kemi you know do you feel like you play for yourselves and we were like, yeah. And they were like, well, that's kind of selfish. And we were like, yeah, hang on a minute, though. What I would like to hear if I was out there as a punter, not, OK, I have to play because I work for Metalheads. I'm just going to play Metalheads. That's not what we were about at all. We played every label. And maybe we did highlight. I mean, we got Metalhead stuff really early. So we were actually really lucky because um, dub plates were the thing then. It was what you had in your bag as to how people would book you. It was important then, you know, who what kind of labels did you have in your bag and what artists did you have in your bag and have you got the hottest tunes? And when you were going abroad, you were kind of conscious of, well, we're trying to export this music from the UK right now and we hope, we hope you get it. And I think a great DJ will always take you by the hand and walk you through their set. And I think that's one of the best compliments you can ever get is that I didn't really like drum and bass before and now I've heard you, you've made me understand it. And you'd be like, yes. You know, another convert. <laughs> I mean, then scarcity was actually a USP for you getting work, getting gigs. Now it's rather the opposite and there's an abundance, an overabundance of things. How do you navigate that? Well, I think it took me a long time to get my head around social media. Um, I had, yeah, I mean, a, a big DJ had a really good shout at me a couple of years ago and just kind of put me in my place about it because I maybe naively didn't realize how social media works. You know, we had a, we had a very face-to-face um, -face scene years ago. We would go to a place called Music House where we would cut our dub plates. So not only would you see people from London, Marcus Intellects would come from Manchester to cut his dub plates. Ronnie Size would come from Bristol. You know, um, Simon Baseline Smith would come from up north uh, in Derby. And so now you had this community face to face. Um, everything was done on the phone. Um, we had a fax machine. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how you communicated back in the day. And to kind of see the way that social media has changed things and almost you see some artists now be packaged. You know, there's a, they become, I think the producer DJ changed a lot of things because obviously when vinyl was really big back in the day when we started Metalheads, you know, when we finally got it established, we were maybe selling 50 to 75,000 pieces of vinyl per vinyl. And so the engineer at home was happy with that money. Now, when things changed, a lot of producers decided they needed to become DJs because they couldn't get their money out of labels. And it's a very underground scene. There was never a lot of money around in our scene, only at certain points. You see drum and bass kind of go on a little bit of roller coaster every now and again. And I think then once, I mean, it's like Dillinger always said, the worst thing I ever did was DJ because the money was in my hand. And now I can't turn my back on it because getting my money for my release from this label or this label, <coughs> maybe you never ever got it. So it was a way of, yeah, 
you know, people grow up, they have children, and you have to sustain a house and, and live. So the producer DJ was kind of born, and um, I think a lot of the DJs really got their noses put out of joint a little bit. And I suppose for me to sustain my career, I had to think differently when social media came along. And um, like I say, quite a big DJ had a really big shout at me and, you know, told me kind of what to do and what it was all about. And, and I kind of knew it, but I kind of resisted it because I'm very old school, do you know what I mean? And obviously dub plates were no longer being cut. We'd moved on to CDs. It was a very different thing. You really didn't have that dub plate anymore. And, and I suppose we didn't have this community where we all saw each other. We were now... I don't know, talking on Facebook and talking on, what was the first one we had? Or, um, MySpace. Yeah, MySpace, yeah, yeah, Tom. <laughs> Tom. Tom on MySpace, yeah. But there was, there was a messenger thing that people used to use. Uh, ICQ. Yes, exactly, yeah, and I never used that. I never knew what it was all about. And I think, yeah, I suppose I've been always quite physical. I mean, even, you know, getting a laptop and, you know, having a smartphone was a bit much for me. <laughs> and now I've embraced it. And you have to, you have to, it's a global thing now. And I mean, it, it's interesting. I look at when Kemi passed, that's all we had was kind of MySpace. And I have a big, I have two A4 books of faxes that people sent to me all around the world to the Metalhead's office. But then I look when Marcus Intellects passed last year, it was like overkill. You know, you couldn't, I had to turn it off for a while because it was almost too much. But you know, the whole world did want to commiserate, of course. But then what I, I suppose I don't really get about um, social media is the negativity behind it. You know, I've always been quite positive. Even if I'm feeling maybe angry about a subject and I'm doing an interview, I will still always be positive because I think that, that then translates to people that are reading the interview that I do. I want, I want you to come and join our scene. I do think drum and bass is all come as welcome. And, and, and I want you to come out and feel comfortable, you know? And I think, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's been a different, different thing for me to never, I, I've always, I don't want to, I will, if I have to say something and be controversial and I feel really passionate about it on, on social media, I will. But I kind of see it now for me as a business tool. And I do think that over the years, I've realized that DJ Storm has her own persona and Jane has her own persona. And lots of people can get to interact with DJ Storm, but not everybody gets to know Jane. You know, they are, I'm, I'm definitely two different people. I'm definitely a performer when DJ Storm starts to happen. And don't phone me and talk to me when I'm getting ready and doing my DJ Storm rituals. <laughs> I'm not going to answer you, you know, because once I become DJ Storm, it's all about being a professional and it's all about doing my best job. And, you know, whereas Jane can, you know, have a little bit of fun and lark about. And if you, like Sammy knows from she's Sun and Bass, she can, she's got to know Jane a little bit more now, you know. So you can get to, you know, if, you, if you're able to spend time with me. And I think doing the boiler room really opened my eyes. I mean, wow, there was people that hated me for the whole time I played. <laughs> and I just, I didn't understand it. Do you know what I mean? But my friends just say to me, well, that's, that's how it is now. I mean, one girl, she just... I mean, she hated my lipstick, she hated my hair, she hated, you know, and I don't know if anybody watched the boiler room thing, but they'd obviously asked me to do this final set, and then they hadn't got a clue about the decks. Well, I mean, if it's any consolation, um, I was getting a fair amount of email of like, hey, you RBMA people, get the fact fat cunt with the German accent off the stage and it's like, it's like um, oh. thanks you speaking to him <laughs> it's like, I was like okay alright but um, yeah I mean give, give someone um, a hedge and a rifle and they become a sniper so that's fair yeah sure sure yeah but, but I, I found that I mean again I think that's I think doing Boiler Room really opened my eyes because I had the most hits ever and that to me was phenomenal you know I mean even Goldie phoned me and was like wow you got more hits than me and I said, no, I How don't. How did you take that? Yeah, well, you know, I always act surprised. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I was so surprised. <laughs> and um, he was like, what happened there? I said, well, I'm not sure if it was just for me, but I think, you know, obviously the guy who booked me Mum Dance, he's pretty yeah, he's famous, you know what I mean? He's got a massive following and different circles. His label has got a huge following. And, you uh -huh. know, and, and it's interesting because I asked him, why was it me that you booked? And he said, well, I've got that story like you have about Groove and Fabio. He said, you know, when I was 
15, I broke into Essential Festival at Finsbury Park, and the first DJs I saw were Chemistry and Storm, and you changed my life. And I was like, wow. You know, and he said, and all these years on, Tom, who works for his label, happened to work for my agency, and he was sitting in their office saying, you know, um, oh yeah, I'm just, I've just taken on DJ Storm, and Jack Mumdance was just, oh my God, I went around Boiler Room. So they approached me, and I said to my friend, oh yeah, this guy's asked me to do Boiler Room. What's that all about? She's like, oh my God, do it, do it, do it, do it. I said, okay. So I even walked into Boiler Room pretty naive, and then I saw it, and I was like, oh my God, they're really close, right? Everybody was, <laughs> everybody was really close, yes. And of course, the deck didn't work on the right, so, you know, and my friend's saying to me, don't forget, you've got six cameras on you and three mobile ones, and I'm turning around to her going, for God's sake, get me the sound, man, and screaming at her, and I'm turning around going, <laughs> you know, I'd kind of got it now, do you know what I mean? I'd kind of got a little bit of, kind of nouse about it now, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, big up mum dance. Um, <laughs> If we stretch away the shouting, what did that certain big name DJ teach you that you would like to share with other people? Well, that I need to get my own Facebook page for DJ Storm, not just Jane. Um, and then I literally had to work it every month, put something on there every month, there was, there was a mix. I mean, you know, when you think about it, it's a bit stupid not to realize that you can't be booked unless somebody can hear you. So, yeah, you, I didn't really think, because I'm a bit naive and a bit ignorant about social media, I didn't think about things like that, putting my set up and, you know, and kind of encouraging people to come and listen to it and having Mixcloud and Soundcloud and all those kind of things. So, yeah, that DJ taught me a lot about, you know, and even things like that, liking, liking an event. You know, and I've, I don't know how many gigs I've got from liking an event. And they're like, oh, my God, is that really you, DJ Storm? And I was like, yeah, can we book you? We haven't got a lot of money, but uh, yeah, okay. And I mean, I've had those times in the last few years where my career's not been great. And I've just really had to say to myself, do I still want this? And I, I really do. I'm still as excited <laughs> when I get on the decks as I first was. I, You know, I don't think that will ever leave me. I really... Well, my, my most comfortable place is in the mix. I love it, you know, and I love creating things and I love, you know, making tunes sound different and that live mixing for me, I don't like tricks and I just, you know, really what came out of drum and bass, I think, in the in the beginning was mix and blending. It wasn't, the crossfader wasn't used too much before kind of drum and bass DJs came along and we really took the live mixing of two tunes to another level. And I think if you're going to do that, then mess around with it and have fun with it and, and, you know, kind of create something so that, you know, you might be going along really calmly in your set and then you just flip it and everybody's just, whoa. You know, you want to make... I don't want to be easy on the crowd. You know, I, I, I want to... I want to make you dance, of course, that's the, that's the bottom line, but I, I want us to go on a little bit of a journey together, you know what I mean? And I think, you know, putting sets up and those kind of things got me noticed again. But I have to say that I think Boiler Room changed things for me in a big way, you know, because I wasn't expecting it. And then all of a sudden I think people were like, oh my God, is DJ Storm still alive? Okay, it's Booker then, is she still working? And I think really I'd done that to myself by not being part of the whole social media revolution. That was my mistake, you know, and now that was the best advice that DJ could have given me to have something on that page, whether it's an interview, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a mix, every single month there has to be something of interest so that people can look at your page and that really helps because people are looking at things all the time. I mean, it's a minefield out there, you know, and I've just had to start Instagram now, you know, I mean, it's, I can't do any more. <laughs> but how did you overcome and how do you navigate it so that it doesn't get too much and you don't feel like you're giving away too much because I mean you literally grew up in a world where it was a lot about keeping your privacy people would be performing yeah. with all sorts of masks a lot and all these sort of things And you yeah well I think you have to be I, I think you have to be open to it and I think you have to be happy about what you're doing as well and I think I mean, you know, doing a mix, I don't think, is, is a difficult thing to do, especially not for me. I love it, you know what I mean? So um, I think it's been... I think it's been... I've, I've looked at it as something exciting rather than some chore. I think if I'd gone that way and thought, oh, God, I've got to do another mix for Facebook and... No, you've got to kind of... You've got to change your attitude. 
And if you want to be out there, it's here now. There's nothing I can do about it. It's here. All these things are here. And I don't want it to feel like I'm doing it just to progress my career. I feel like I want to enjoy it as well. So I think I've started to enjoy it. But you're clearly differentiating between you as the person and the product that you put out there. Yeah, well, I suppose I am to a certain extent, but I think... How many times do you post the hotel food that you had? <laughs> Now, that kind of stuff I don't do. I don't understand that. You know, when certain artists gets up and they go, right, and they put a picture of their breakfast and go, I've just had a lovely breakfast. I'm like, why did you do that? Yeah, I, yeah, you. I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Randall, when I played at Boomtown, he did a video for me. I, did, <laughs> I didn't do one. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not great at taking... I mean, maybe you can tell me. You know, if I'm playing to you in the club, do you want to see the picture of that club later the next day? You know, lots of DJs take big pictures of the club and thanks for playing. And I mean, I will always the next morning thank the promoter. You know what I mean? Of course, that's a personal thing between me and them. But do you want to see that? I don't know. You know, I, I can't answer that question. I guess there's way too many pictures of us at five in the morning already <laughs> anyway. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, mm, yeah. So yeah, you're right. I don't. It's I do still see all of the social media to social media sites as a business. Yeah, DJ Storm is definitely a business when she's out there. And I have two pages now on Facebook: Jane Keneally and DJ Storm. And DJ Storm, the page tends to do the business, whereas Jane Keneally, she might have a little bit of fun. And you know, I mean, everybody knows it's 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 me. You know, the picture is not that different. <laughs> You know, maybe a few years apart, um, but um, yeah, but um, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of quite like using them both now, you know, because I can have a little bit of fun with Jane. You know what I mean? And and, and the one thing I really love is Twitter. That's been my favourite one because I quite like that instantness about it. And the drum and bass community really got behind Twitter. You know, we really enjoy it. And um, I mean, now obviously everybody's got behind Instagram, and I'm just kind of getting my head around it now. My friend put the app on three months ago, but she never taught me how to use it. So I'm kind of navigating my way. So if you're trying to follow me, I'll get there eventually, okay? Yeah, just give me some time. <laughs> well, the thing that you totally do get is your actual graft and the mixing. Um, I mean, you've always been known for one of the most impeccable mixes out there and for building the drama of a, of a set and all those things. How much time do you still invest in the actual graft? Um, for me, it's more, over the years, it's more in my head, the mixes. I still do that. I still dream of mixes. And then I get up the next morning and do them and go, oh, yeah, that's wicked. You know what I mean? I mean, that really, you know, you hear, I, I, whether it's because I've been mixing for years now, I don't know. But, I, I mean, it was funny because Digital's just remastered Space Funk. And he was asking me to do a little write-up for him. So I said, well, Space Funk is quite funny because it was Kemi's turn to have Space Funk. And I, you know, we would get gutted, you know, like, oh, you know, oh, she got Silver Blade, oh, yeah, she, you know. And we would, you know, then we both did it. We both knew what was happening. When the other one would go out, you know, the other one would have a mix with those tunes, you know, not out, but maybe at home, do you know what I mean? And we would find mixes for each other every now and again. And Space Funk was quite a funny one because, you know, we both wanted it. But it was her turn to have the digital 12, and that was hers. And, of course, she went out one day. And I think she kind of smelt something that, you know, I wanted to get my hands on that Naughty Eamon track. Do you know what I mean? And, of course, she went out, and, you know, I heard her from the kitchen going, coming back in going, is that Space Funk I can hear? It was, oh, Kem, sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I couldn't resist. And we both understood, you know, and digital laughed at the kind of little story I told. And, you know, and, and I think... I think, you know, that was, that again, you know, we did understand each other's vibe, but there were those tunes that we knew we both could play, but it, we took it in turns, you know what I mean? And that was interesting. But I still give as much to my craft as possible. You know, I mean, I still try to work really hard on putting things together a different way. But I think after all these years, I do hear a lot more in my head, you know, of what goes together. You know, and you might have, you might have a busy week where you don't get the chance to mix. So you go out with new tunes and 
pretty much normally they always work. And of course you can hear in your headphones if a chord is not going to work with another track. You can hear it pretty much and then you have to rush for another tune and think, oh no, that definitely didn't work. It worked in my dream last night, but today it's not working. You know what I mean? And because I've always had that musical background, I can hear it straight away if chords are clashing and I want my bass lines to work as well. For me, it has to work musically all the way along. And, you know, I have to pull that face, this face. When I hear another DJ chord clashing, I had to go. <laughs> I'm thinking, ew. <laughs> Speaking of listening to other DJs, do you find that mixing has changed with all the visual cues that devices like this provide? Well, lots of people go on about cue points now. And um, to a certain extent, I suppose, thinking about it, I've had this debate with a few people recently about cue points. If there was a beginning that had nothing kind of going on, we would all still play it. And of course, you would rush to the beats, that's the cue point, and then go back to the beginning. What happens now is that they don't go back to the beginning. They just hit the cue point. I mean, I've discovered my partner had Serato quite early so he's a reggae dj and i i learned about cue points from him you know and i thought well i don't really need them you know and i mean i was having this debate with spirit the other day and he was saying yeah but if you've got the cue point at least it's quick and i said yeah but when i think about it on vinyl you could always see that was the beauty of vinyl you could see the cue point so you could go straight to it pretty much yes you've got to go to it a little bit here but i will still always go back to the beginning of the tune because i'm still a great believer that Because I don't produce, I'm not going to start messing about with someone else's tune. Now, I know with Serato and with the USBs, I think you can loop kind of sections. And I've seen it done, but I don't think I have the capability to do that. And like I say, I don't produce, so I'm not then going to start to disrespect the tune that you gave me to play by messing about with it. And I've heard a lot of sets where there's so much looping going on, they never get to the drop. So there's no atmospheric space. And I still love that. You know what I mean? I still want that. I've heard sets and they just go and go and go and then go and go and, and they just come at you and they just come at you. And obviously you get a lot of, since the producer DJ, a set of tunes that maybe sound quite similar because they're their own productions. And I think when I hear that and 30 seconds of mixing, it doesn't really impress me. Um, I have to gloss over it because it's here now. Um, but I kind of maybe just think, oh, I'm ready to kill you in the mix now. <laughs> but I guess it's also a rather male approach as well, thinking that because I'm DJ, a.k.a. God, I can make your tune so much better and that's why I need to do an edit of it and like make sure I only I know what your tune really sounds like. Rather. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that impression. I heard that. I had a big debate with someone about this in Sun and Bass last year, <laughs> and they do that a lot. And they had heard that I wasn't too happy about that. And I had to explain to them that, you know, these are not my tunes. I'm lucky enough for these people to give me their tunes. They respect me enough to give me their tunes, and hopefully I'm going to do a good job with them. That's how I think. And I mean, still, if that producer walks in, the dance and I'm mixing, I get a little, Ooh, oh God, I hope he likes it. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, and I mean, there's another thing. It is mostly guys. What can I say with production? I mean, I'm not sure what's wrong with us ladies, but you know, maybe we can touch on that a little bit later. Um, but um, I just, I mean, this guy was saying to me, well, it's my tune. And, and I start to think, da, 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 I just want to change it right now. And I said, yeah, but are you looking at the crowd? Are you actually paying attention? Because I always think that's obviously the most important thing. Not everybody's going to like every single track that you're playing. And I think for me, it's a little bit easier because I feel like I play a little bit of everything. So hopefully in the set somewhere, you're going to hear a tune that really turns you on. And um, I think I hear a lot of sets that sound very similar now. And you can be doing all this trickery But because the sister tunes sound all the same, I'm not quite sure what you're achieving. Because it's, and I think it's easy. You know, the sound that is around now is very easy. Um, it has a lot of mid-range bass and it has a lot of what I call the wah-wah sound. It's a bit wah-wah-wah, wah-wah-wah. And it doesn't do a lot to me because 
I think back to some of the early producers that have used that sound and they've used it in a much more exciting way. Maybe there's a glimmer of it. It's not the whole theme of the tune and it's become very mid-range. Well, drum and bass is about drum and bass. It needs to have bass. It's not called drum and mid-range bass. It's called drum and bass. And I want to hear that. And I want to... And there's where I'll be controversial. And some people have said to me in the last few years, oh, Storm, you don't get it. I said, well, I, I get it. I just don't want to be bored when I'm playing. I can't play something that doesn't move me in here. You know, whether it's... People say, well, yeah, but that producer's really hot and, you know, and you should be playing their tunes. And I said, yeah, but if it doesn't move me in here then I'm being untrue to DJ Storm. I can't, I don't play things because they're trendy or because this producer's hot, you know what I mean? I play things that move me. And so far, touch wood, I've, I've been able to, I've never cleared a dance floor, you know, and I've, I, I've had to come on after some of these producers, you know, and maybe the last three producers to me have all sounded the same. And then I have to think very carefully about how I'm going to start my set now because I can't just... I think I play quite dramatically. I think that's what, I, and when we look at, when I look at a label like Metalheads, you couldn't say, some people say it's dark. Some people say it's, 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 it's light. It's, you can have lots of opinion about Metalheads, but the one thing that Metalheads had in its tunes was drama. There was a lot of drama and tension. And even if it was a musical tune, it still had certain amounts of tension and drama and, and it painted pictures in your minds, you know, and that's what I see. I still see pictures in drum and bass, you know what I mean? And I think to a certain extent, that's how I play. So if I've come on after three, what I feel are quite flat sets, then I have to be careful. I can't just go bam and just kind of, you know, bring you my drama straight away. I've got to kind of work it very carefully so that by the time I get to that point where I really want to get quite dramatic, I've got to give you a few tunes. Not those tunes that they're playing, but my version of that to a certain extent. You know, maybe something not quite so in your face and then I have to build to where I'm going. And the other thing is when you've heard sets like that that don't have a lot of music, I have to think now, do the crowd like music? So I might choose something that's maybe a little bit older that people know. You know, that's something, maybe a remix of something that was in, in the charts or we don't do many of those, but we have a few of those. Spy's done a few of those. And once I've got you with a piece of music, then I realise, OK, let's go. Do you know what I mean? And I think I have to think about my set much more carefully when I'm playing after three sets to me that have all sounded the same. I can't just come in, because I might scare you, you know, and then I might scare you away out of the dance, and I don't want to do that. So, so far, I've, I've done a good job. But again, I think when you're a DJ, you need to turn up early, you know, to hear what the DJ is playing before and feel where, you know, your range of where you're going. Do you know what I mean? You still will play your tunes, but you might play them in a slightly different order that night. You know, just to kind of, you know, you, you're always going to start your set and kind of show that you're here. And I think your start tune is, is incredibly important as to how you're going to stand on the decks and show your, you've arrived. Do you know what I mean? And I tend to keep start tunes for sometimes maybe three or four months, so that I come in and people, DJ Storm, she's on, you know what I mean? Because now there's not so many DJs with different styles. A producer DJ, some of them are great, but some of them just tend to, like I say, it's very minimal mixing. They're not creating too much in the mix. It just goes along for me. And I find that, yeah, just a little bit boring. You know, I want, I want more than that, you know what I mean? And I think back in the day when you walked in the dance, I wouldn't have had to see the DJ. I would have known if it was Groove Rider or Kenny Ken or Nicky Black Market. Now, sometimes I haven't got a clue. I don't know because the sets all sound the same. That you know, that's, and, and I can see that the sound, thousands of people love it because it's selling, you know what I mean? It's just not for me, you know what I mean? And some producers get quite angry with me that I won't play their tunes, but I can't, I can't play something that doesn't appeal to me you can't I can't do that you know what I mean and I think that's what makes me individual and I think that's what makes a lot of DJs real DJs individual that they play what they feel and if I if I'm feeling it then I can do something even more impressive in the mix with it so that's how I feel about it you know and I I hear <coughs> I hear a lot of the sound creeping into all labels and I was with a big I was at a big festival 
earlier in the year and I was with a guy from a really, really big label that maybe I feel is most probably a little bit commercial. And he said to me, you know, what is your problem with this sound? And I said, well, when I think about how drum and bass came and how it evolved and the excitement of it, there really wasn't a format. You know, I mean, you look at Close Your Eyes by Asen. I mean, it's got, it's got a big piano riff, which is from House. It's got a bit of techno in it. It's got a bit of acid. It had no form or function because I suppose, you know, everybody was experimenting with sounds. And I suppose, you know, you have those times that are really exciting when a music is, de is developing. And I suppose now after all these years, drum and bass is, I suppose, a little bit formatted. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, and I think maybe back in the day it was a little bit crazier. So I've come from a time where there were all different styles and I can't really change that. And I suppose if you've come in, you know, in the last few years where the sound is maybe a little bit flatter, maybe that's what you're used to, you know, and a lot of DJs were pushed to the side a little bit because the producer DJ was where it was at. And I do think that stuff is very, it's easy. You know what I mean? It, it's easy, it comes at you. It, dro it doesn't drop around you, it doesn't make your head turn. I mean, you know, when I think about some of Goldie's first tunes, you know, he could make a sound come from what felt right behind you, bring it to the front and hit you on the face. And silly things like that, Fotec going out with his DAT machine and breaking off branches and recording it and then making a break out of it. And, you know, Goldie spinning, Goldie loved the spinning of a coin, you know, and it's in his new album now. There's a coin spin and he also had a glass smash. And, you know, it was just more exciting, you know, and I don't, I want my set to be exciting like that. And I, I, there is a place for all of it now. There's a place for Jump Up, which is a really big scene now at the moment. There's a place for, I'm not quite sure what you call the mid-range stuff, but there is a place for it. You know, and I think in the last couple of years, the DJ, I think, especially with someone like DJ Randall, who's really kind of come to the forefront, he's made mixing more acceptable again. So now people are starting to book DJs again. But like I say, it goes in, it goes in a bit of a roller coaster, you know, and I think, but like I was saying to this guy at the festival, he was saying, you know, you always, you're not interested. You know, you have this button when you get a promo now and it says not interested. And I said, you know what? 10 years ago, maybe even five, you could have given me 10 tracks and said to me, Storm, place those at a label. And I could have done it. Now, I couldn't tell you because you're all using the same sounds. And I thought drum and bass was about being individual and being and making an impression and having a sound. And I think all those old producers who are still there, and there's some new people who are influenced by them, they have still have their own sound. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? It's still, digital will still put effects on a break, you know, which actually makes it harder to mix. And it's very two-step now, the... I want to hear an Eamon break, and I want to hear the Apache break, and I want to hear, I want, I want breaks on, breaks on, breaks. If I could have breaks in, breaks on, breaks, I'd just be a happy girl. You know, and that's what I try to do, you know. So I never, you never stop, you know. It's all good. Do -do 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 -do. You do know what I mean? And it's, it's, to me, it's exciting. You know, maybe to those others, my set is really boring to them. You know, that's, that's fair enough. You know what I mean? But I could do what you do. If you gave me your set, I could still make it sing. That's working hard. You'd have to work hard to make that rise and fall with that sound. But I would do it if I had to and show you how your tunes could sound because for me, I'm the ultimate DJ. I just, I want to be there in the mix and making things exciting, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, I see people now, you have to do this now and re 30 second, raise your hands. You know, I'm not saying I don't raise my hands. I do sometimes, you know what I mean? But it's taken a long time for me to raise my hands and be, hi. <laughs> you know, I see DJs do that now. <laughs> well, I guess that's that's been around for, for a minute anyway. Speaking of raising hands, it's like, this is probably not the Bible or the Holy Quran or the Talmud <laughs> or anything, but a book I've always heard about but I've never seen in the flesh. Right. And I don't know whether you ever put it out out in the first place. And um, Yeah, I mean, Goldie different, desperately wants this book. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I was, yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, let me go and, and let you know how anal I am about my music and my scene. When we first started buying our records, I had a, all we had pretty much was a diary. And I wrote down, I suppose, all the house and techno tunes we had then. Well, then I got a book, enough money to buy a book. And I've written down, me and Kemi wrote down every 
tune and what month we bought them in. So this one starts in November 97, 91, and it goes up to 97. And it's quite interesting because, yeah, we didn't mind filling this out because we loved it. The, the record shop that we used to go to used to have a book of promos. And we were like, What shop oh. was that? That was uh, Music Power. And um, we thought, oh, that's a great... You know, that's fantastic. Look, they've got everything logged, do you know what I mean? So that's where it came from. And then we wanted everything logged. So before this, I do have a diary from 88. <laughs> so, yeah, and I was really obsessed with them because, you know, you had lots of different mix on some house things and I've even got the timings down of them. <laughs> Just really nutty, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, we've written everything down and, um, you know, there's my writing and Kemi's writing and, yeah, and... It, it, to be honest, I'm kind of glad I have it because when I'm asked to do a 92 set, I can just go, oh, oh okay, what came out in 92? And I can get it really... And look, there's Kemi's writing, the record count to date. We had 761 records by then. <laughs> yeah, and the first track, Last Train to Paradise, is not technically a drum and bass tune to start with. Um, yeah, yeah. Quasar was a, a kind of a, what would you call it, a techno label? Yeah, techno yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's lots of interesting... I mean, Warp really wasn't a drum and bass label. Yeah. And it developed into kind of another label. And it's interesting to look at this, because you can see how many releases there were per month, and it was a lot. And as you go on, it gets less and less and less mm -hmm. as the years and the months go on. You know, And that's interesting, because I think, like you say, we drew from different things, jumping and pumping became something else, and um, let me think, there's R&S stuff in here somewhere, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, <laughs> some of the things in here are really silly because we've just got <coughs> dub plate, white. I don't know why we wrote it in there. It doesn't mean anything when I look back at it, but you know, you know, silly things in there. But we've got all the original Metalhead stuff in here, and and it's, it's quite lovely to look at sometimes, do you know what I mean? And and I go back and reminisce and, oh, remember what that sounds like? And then I go and try and find it in my storage base of vinyl. So, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's been an important book, really. And I love going back to it. And I've got my first, as well as the back, we've got, this is when we started to play at Laserdrome and we kept all our stickers, because you got a sticker every time you played. <laughs> nice. <laughs> because, yeah, I, I think, I lived and breathed this scene, you know, and I think to a certain extent people say, you know, as a woman, do you have to work a little bit harder? I'm not sure if you have to work harder, but I think you have to think a few steps ahead of yourself. Like, where do I want to go? And I do think that women overthink things, I think, a bit, you know, and we're good at organisation. And, th you know, to a certain extent, one thing Kemi said that was really true, that men are brought up to put their energies into things, like their car. They might even give it a name and they'll wash it. And Whereas a girl will go, oh, as long as it goes, you know what I mean? Uh, it'll be fine. You know, whereas women are taught to put their energies into people. Naturally, we're the maternal things. Now, I, Kemi and I made that decision years ago that we didn't want children. But boy, did we have some sons at Metalheads, you know, that we, they were young and they needed guidance. And we were that little bit older. We'd both had careers. So we were able to guide them. And Goldie wanted this family. He never had his father really around, and he wanted this extended family. And I do think he became a father figure to them, and I think Kemi and I definitely became motherly figures to them. And if they were had problems in their life, they could call us 24-7, and we'd be there for them. You know what I mean? And I think because we were that little bit older, that was easy for us. And I do think that's how the Metalheads family was born. And most probably the V family and the Moving Shadow family. And you, there was always that kind of, you know, guidance, I think, from a woman that we're going to... Yeah, I suppose you, J Magic was like... Our, we always said J Magic was our drum and bass baby. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think this kind of just is a lovely thing to have now. Like I say, a lot of people want it, but um, yeah, and there's Goldie when he was Mac, because we were Mac 3 first, and he was our MC Mac Daddy G, so <laughs> that was quite funny, because I've just got into, I think it will be, it was May last year that I was 25 years that Chemistry and Storm stood on the decks. Now, it was most probably 26 that Mac 3 stood on the decks, but then we lost Greg, he didn't want to DJ anymore, and obviously Goldie went on to do other things than BRMC. So Chemistry and Storm were properly born 25 years ago. We stood on the decks as Chemistry and Storm. So that's quite been quite pivotal for me, you know, to think that I'm still here, you know, and still loving it. Because that's the other thing. I, the one piece of advice I can give you, you have to know that you want it. 
And not that you're prepared to do anything, you know, but within reason, yeah, you're prepared to do anything to get where you want to be. And um, it's not always an easy road. And it is, you have to be quite selfish. And um, I'm not sure women are great at being selfish at times, but we have to. And I've learned a lot from looking at the guys because they do have that thing that sometimes women hold themselves back a bit. Whereas a guy will go, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. And they do. And that's brilliant. And I think women are like, oh, can I? I don't know. You know what I mean? And I think you've got to get over that. And I think that's most probably where two of us together helped, that we had blinkers on a little bit, you know? Yeah. But I guess as far as confidence goes, about any breathing human being can learn a thing or two from the G-man. Yeah, of course, of course. Yes. Yeah, he was a force to be reckoned with, really. Yeah. Um, how do you navigate this whole thing of, I mean, when you say you get asked to play a 92 set or so, I mean, obviously you are breathing this thing, you have been around, all this history is within you, but you don't want to be a museum relic. No, no, you have to draw a line between just becoming an old school DJ and, yeah, I mean, there are old school DJs who just play old school and they've never moved on, you know what I mean? And that's fine because what do you call it, um, oh, hardcore, that's still kind of existing, you know what I mean? And those events are great to do. But I had to draw a line and say, okay, I'm only going to do one organization. I tend to do moon dance. It was something I was, Funky, the guy who runs that, he gave Kemi and myself our first residency. And I'm always happy to do something there. And it's bizarre because you get a 45 minute set and I really love playing around with old school now. I love like playing, clashing the eras now. And in 45 minutes, I've managed to go from 1992 to 1998 in 45 minutes. You have to be really careful when you're doing that kind of set because you have to know at some point there's going to be a rewind. You, you have to bank on it because you need to pull up the speed. <laughs> so I quite enjoy messing about with old school now instead of just playing a straight set. Obviously, if I'm asked to do a 92 set, I will try and stick into the 92 parameters as much. But as you can see, in 92, there was lots of, lots of stuff to go for. So again, I like messing about with it now. And I think, yeah, for me, because they asked me to do an old school set of Boiler Room, I had loads of requests to do old school sets and vinyl and you have to just balance it out because I don't want to just be seen as an old school DJ even though I've still got my storage space of all my records and I can go and get them do you know what I mean but I like to I like to try and mess about a little bit with old school now you know but I mean it's kind of interesting that especially a genre that was so much priding itself on being about futurism the next level trying to reach new plateaus trying to figure out what the technology can do then becoming a stalwart. It's almost, when we were kids, we looked at the Who singing, oh, I hope I die before I get old, and all of a sudden we're past 40. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they still sing it way past 60. Yeah. So, um, how does the, the crew around you navigate all that? Well, the other thing as well, obviously, as we all know, I'm totally affiliated to Metalheads. And at sometimes, you know, if I've got, say, a two hour set, which is a lovely thing to have and a rare thing to have, people at some point will go to me, oh, can't you just play Metropolis? And I will, you know what I mean? But like I say, I like to mess about with it now and make it a little bit more interesting because those tunes were very dramatic anyway. So I, I like to do that. And I mean, it was interesting when I played, um, the last set I ever did with Marcus Intellects, actually, we played at Recycle in Berlin and Gretchen. And um, it was, I think it was 20 years of Recycle. And they'd asked him to do a um, solution set. And they'd asked me to do a metalhead set. Now, in the last few years, things have changed a little bit in Gretchen because it's a big club. And you've got to fill that place, you know. So it's tend to have a few more commercial, not commercial, commercial nights, but certain artists that you know, the, the kind of the neurofunk thing that appeals to a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? The hospitality nights, they appeal to a certain crowd. So I suppose Marcus and I hadn't played in there for a while. And they'd asked us to do this old school set. Now, pretty much every time I played Metropolis, people will know it. And they didn't flinch in, in Gretchen. And Marcus went to me, ooh, what are we going to do? I said, I've got no idea, but we need to make these people dance. He was like, right, come on. You know what I mean? So we just sat there and we thought about it. And we were like, OK, right, right. Let me try this. Let me try this. We were determined. You know what I mean? We weren't. 
oh, to hell with this crowd then. At the end of the day, they paid money to come and see me too. And I, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in earning your money. You know what I mean? So, <coughs> excuse me. So we kind of, I did my next one and I got them a little bit more and Marcus was like, I know, this one will work. And they kind of, and slowly, 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 we got them, do you know what I mean? And it was quite fascinating because Marcus was over here on USBs and I was on vinyl. And I didn't realize we'd got two mixers. He's the producer and engineer. So the next minute I'm mixing and he's mixing on top of my mix. So he was like, oh, we're like Orbital. You know what I mean? We need to get the glasses next time. You know what I mean? So oh, he had the glasses. Yeah, he's got the glasses. Yeah, yeah. didn't have the lights. So you know what I mean? John B. That's, that's John B. So um, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was intriguing to think, wow, because I've always felt that even if you don't know the Metalhead stuff, they stand the test of time, you know, these tunes. And all of a sudden it didn't. And it was a little bit shocking, you know what I mean? And then we looked at the crowd and we were like, wow, okay. But we were, all, we're determined to get them. And we did by the end of the set. So, you know, we were happy. But as far as longevity goes, I mean, when Metropolis came out, someone who's been playing Ibiza records and Tom and Jerry records and a DJ Seduction record or whatever, um, all was already considered old, old school. Mm. Um, that is 20 years ago now. Yeah. And and still people were old enough to feel, still feel that youthful sprite and be invincible and think nothing would ever happen and so on. And now we're talking, I mean, I was the second person that has left us already. Yeah. We just talked about who contributed a vast amount of creativity of and course. sound to the scene. Yeah, yeah. And um, when do you think, how how do you navigate this when you we're using way too much navigate uh, here anyway? <laughs> um, but I mean, it is about finding your path in the end. And how do you deal with this when you're planning your year out? When it's Tuesday afternoon and you're like, okay, what do I want to do in the next six months and so on? It's like, well, I have to say, for me, things have really rolled out quite well since the boiler room. I do think that did a lot for me. I mean, two hundred fifty thousand people had watched it by the morning, yeah. and it's it almost yeah i do think it kind of reinvented me a little bit because like i say i wasn't great with the social media so maybe people thought i'd given up or i just wasn't doing it anymore or whatever so to a certain extent the thing that i didn't really understand kind of saved me and it didn't come from my scene it came from a guy who was inspired by me and i kind of like that to a certain extent you know what i mean and it gave me a platform that I don't think my scene would have ever given me. I know certain people have done Boiler Room, but I've certainly never been invited. But I do think that, and me, like I say, I have worked hard building up my career with little events and, you know, watching what's going on on Facebook. And like I say, just liking things and people going, oh, could we book you? We don't have a great amount of money. And, and that's the other thing. It's not always about the money. It really isn't, you know, and especially when you're trying to kind of build yourself up again. You may have to take a drop and make it, but I've never felt it about money. You know, and I think when I was first coming over here, for example, the wages were quite high. You know, and this country was, you could play, you could do seven day tours over here. What's happened to that? You know what I mean? And some of the pr promoters I know, they're older, they had their families and they're not doing it anymore. So you kind of have to wait for the next younger person to come into that territory and hope that they discover you because they're into all the newer producers. So it's taken time again to kind of let people know who you are. And and like I say, I just hit people up now. And I've never been, I think because I'm from the old school where you phone people to get a gig. You know, I, I don't mind doing that. You know, people say, oh God, you know, do you not get ashamed? Mm. I mean, I've, I remember having to say to one promoter who was really like, oh, I don't know, you know. I said, oh, come on, I've played for you for years, you know, and you haven't booked me for years. Yeah, but you know, I said, all right, this is my deal. And this is my bottom line, really. Book me. If I clear the dance floor, don't give me the money. But if I don't, give me a repeat booking. And I'm, I'm you know, I said that to a girl and she was like, oh my God, did you really have to do that? And I said, I don't really don't care what I have to do to get there. And I said, and I don't feel that's me absolutely begging for work. And I said, but it's a good way of putting it rather than I said, you know, you don't think the guys are doing it all the time? Of course they are. They're hitting up that promoter and going, what about me? And I said, but because they maybe put it in a slightly different way than me, then they'll get maybe more an aggressive way, the promoter will give in. Whereas I approach it 
slightly differently, you know? And I think that's a good way of saying it. Well, if I clear your dance floor, don't give me the money. That's, that's it, isn't it, really, you know? Mm. Yeah, so I think, for me, in the last few years, I've just been following a lot of different things, and, and I've, I suppose I've been in the right place at the right time. I played Norberg Festival a few years ago and met a young lady called Nina, who's, I'd heard of her, and I've, I'm pretty much sure I met her years ago, and she was like, oh, I'm doing Golden Poodle Club in Hamburg. And, you know, I hadn't been to Hamburg for years, so that was interesting. And then the guy who booked me last week at, at uh, Geneva, Le Zoo, he was at the same event, and he's waited this time to come and get me, and he's finally got me. So even those chance moments, you know, I, th I do think some of your career is chance, you know, and, and you're in the right place at the right time. Um, and I don't know why that happens. Maybe that's fate. I'm not sure. But I think because... I do my job with integrity as well. People can see that, you know. And again, it, it, again, sometimes it, it can't be all about the big bucks and the big wages. But you, you know, if you want it, you're prepared to do those things. So I could do a lot of things for friends who are starting. You know, what I mean, they say, "Oh, you know, I've only got this much money," and I said, "Yeah, sure. Why not?" It was the same as I suppose feline. When I did feline, if I wasn't going to do it, who was? You know, because before female nights had seemed tacky. And I still see women say today, even in the article that was done from Claire Red Bull in England, she was saying, you know, certain DJs had said, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do female nights. Why not? I'm not ashamed to do a female night. I'm happy to do a female night. Why not? You know, I've done lots of female nights in the last few years where abroad they'll use me as the headliner and they'll bring in all my, their local DJs. Why not? Why shouldn't I be supporting them? You know, if, if not me, then who? You know, I, I am the first lady of drum and bass and I should want to encourage, you know, the ladies because I understand how hard it is and especially abroad. I mean, in, in, in Europe, you know, in, in England, at least there's a, a big scene set, but it's not always the way. And I hear them and they're great DJs. You know what I mean? I mean, I heard a girl playing in, in Zurich the other week and she's still playing vinyl and her set was sick, really. You know what I mean? It was it was a really interesting set to hear, and I'm so glad. You know, she might not have moved on from a certain era, but she's doing it really well, and she had every right to be playing, and the the, the crowd were going crazy for her. You know, and I'm not, I don't shy away from the female thing because, well, I am one. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, and you know, for, for feline, it was the first point in time where I had enough DJs that I could do something monthly and not just have the same five girls. You know what I mean? I think I, I think we had seven or eight or nine of us. And, you know, I was able to kind of share, you know, that kind of love around a little bit. And they were all great DJs, so I could just rely on them to do their job. I didn't have to worry about them. And they all turned up on time. None of them were ever late. When we went abroad, they were up in the morning, you know, no having to get the DJ out of bed or, or leave. I've, I've had to leave no a few naming DJs. Other names. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, it was it was interesting. Um, I was playing in um, Leeds on Friday, and that was interesting. You know, one of my dearest friends from the scene, you know, kind of came up to me afterwards. I again, I'd been asked to do this specific metal headset, and um, he said to me, "You know what? You're the only girl in this whole scene that mixes like a guy." And I said to him, wow, do you know what? That's the most sexist thing you've ever said to me. And he was like, oh, no, I didn't mean it like that. I said, I'm going to use that in Red Bull in a couple of days, OK? You know, I won't name him, but... He I was going to say... It's... He didn't mean it like that, but that comes out of people's mouths. And, and I think what women do is then sometimes go, oh, my God, you know. I mean, I was doing this interview... When was it? About three years ago in Switzerland, and me and another lady, and she was saying, "Oh, I was, I'm, oh, I was really pissed off what someone put on Facebook. Oh, I can't. This guy put. I can't wait to go and see these ladies do their thing tonight, and it's going to be lovely because they, they're more attractive." And she said, "How sexist is that?" I said, "Well, he's right. I'm going to have a little bit of lipstick on and a little bit of an outfit." And I said, "You see, if you get, if you get kind of pushed back by those kind of things, I said I wouldn't sweat the small stuff." Because that kind of thing is absolutely throwaway to me after all these years. I don't look at it like that. You know, and a lot of women feel like they're left out. And, and I think, well, you know, even last year, I got a lot of festivals last year for the first time. Well, instead of going, oh, finally, you know, thank God they booked me. I was just like, oh, I'm really excited. I've got Audio River in Poland. I've got Field Maneuvers. I've got Boomtown. I've got Shambhala. I was exciting, do you know what I mean? I did a great job, everybody loved me, and I, I, it was fantastic. And I don't, I don't, people might say, oh, well, you're a bit naive, and I said, well, it's, 
it's done me good to be consistent, being positive about things rather than having all the negativity of being a woman. I don't, I don't think you, c you need to be negative all the time. Yes, it's tougher. And I mean, I look at, now we've got Kyrist. Now she's producing and she's coming like crazy. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm not sure we have Molly Collins too, I suppose, who's disproved the fact that I always thought now, I'm not sure if you can just come as a female DJ, but she has. And it's interesting to watch her rise, you know, okay, yeah, to a certain extent, she's been a little bit packaged, do you know what I mean? But she's doing a good job once she gets there, do you know what I mean? And Kyrist is interesting because she's making this stuff. I, I don't really play this kind of stuff, do you know what I mean? But she's doing it really well. And now the boys are like, oh, God, have you heard Kyrish? Her production skills are really good, do you know what I mean? So <coughs> that's all encouraging at the end of the day that finally women... I mean, again, you could say to me, why haven't you produced or... And I can't give you an answer, really. I, I, I don't know. I mean, digital's definitely gonna make me come in the studio this year, so shall, we shall see. I think, I think that's most probably a fear for me because I've never been the most technically orientated. It's like we're talking today that I'm still on CDs. I haven't gone to USBs yet. I know I've got to do it, but oh, I've never wanted to be a knob twiddler. I want to, you know, I, I'm a bit physical when I play, so I'm going to have to learn a way how to do it, to be physical as well as doing that. You know, I want to, you know, for me, <laughs> you know, I sent a really angry message out to Pioneer when they started doing this. I said, why are you taking the art out of my mixing ability? You know, at the end of the day, I want to I wanna be able to do something physical, whereas this USB thing seems a very producer kind of thing. I don't know, I could be wrong about that. You know what I mean? But to me, it, it seems more production than just throwing something in and playing it. You know what I mean? You've got to load it all up. You've got record box and, you know, and then you twiddle knobs and go back. That's the key, apparently, the back button. Yeah, so I've learned that one already. <laughs> but I know I'll have to do it at some point because there is now this kind of piece of equipment that doesn't come with the hole for CDs anymore. So I'm going to have to do it at some point. <laughs> As you mentioned, the that boiler room set being such a turning point, if you don't mind, if we could go back a few months, maybe before that, can you remember what you felt like then and what you felt about, you know, where you were going artistically? Well, I suppose before then, that year, I suppose hadn't been, you know, let's go back a little bit before that, because by then, I'd managed to get my career a little bit more solid. But again, you know, you have to look at those kind of things. My agency is huge now. You know, and it's 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 a it's a kind of big animal now, my agency, and it has, you know, ESP originally was about very pure DJs, Marcus Intellects, Clute, myself, Reinforced were on there. Um, and you know, as time's gone on and they've had a family and they have to buy a house and they have to pay their rent and their mortgage and whatever else, it's grown into a huge thing. And I suppose I felt a little bit lost there and a little bit forgotten. And then Marcus left, and Dom left, and Tom left, and I had to sit and really think, am I at the wrong place now? You know, are they not respecting me? You know, and really, I went to Mark after Kemi, and I brought a lot of stuff to the table, if I'm honest, you know what I mean? And I've had to kind of, you have to have those really frank talks with your agent at times about, can they still support you? You know, am I viable on this agency? You know. They're really serious things you think about, and you don't want it to be true that you're kind of lost somewhere, you know, when you've worked really hard all these years, and you've, you've actually brought a lot to the table, and a lot of those original DJs, I encouraged to come to that agency, do you know what I mean? And they were feeling the same, so they left. And then I had a really frank talk with my agent about it, you know, and uh, I've always wanted to be loyal to him, because he's done an amazing job for me over the years. But I felt, yeah, I felt lost in the scheme of all those people, you know, who were more producer DJs, you know, and maybe on that slightly more commercial tip than I'm on, do you know what I mean? And um, they brought in someone to kind of deal with that underground. He actually wanted to keep it. And so me working with him a little bit more, and it's interesting, isn't it, that the guy they brought in was the Tom guy who got me to mum dance. So wh was it fate? You know what I mean? And I do think that it was a little bit. And I think before that, though, I'd started getting a lot of my own work. I would say my own work was more 70% what they were getting. And I was doing it by hitting people up on Facebook, 
looking at who's around in Europe. Can I hit them up and you know? And because I I don't I don't really I don't know whether I could go and do just a day job anymore after all the years I've been in it. I still truly love it and it's my passion. And I don't know whether I'm you know I've, I've always said to Goldie you know when are we going to stop? He said well Rodigan's the benchmark isn't he? You know what I mean? And once he because Goldie said even if we're even if we've got a Zimmer or something as long as we can go like that and like that we should be all right. You know what I mean? I said yeah but will we be able to hear? Goldie said we'll just get one of those old trumpets you know like from years ago put it on the monitor. <laughs> so we got ways around it. But yeah it was a tough time. Those couple of years before that I wasn't. Well, I'd maybe have a couple of months where I wasn't doing any work. And it was really worrying. You and know? did you consider a calling and quits? And No. I just had to think, sit down, think about all the contacts I'd got over the years. Right, who can I hit up? You know, okay, who can I hit up on the phone first? Who hasn't booked me for a while? Then you go onto Facebook and you look at all the events. Okay, 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 okay. And you start, you know... And I did, I suppose I devised a little plan, really, which is how I suppose me and Kemi built our career in the first place. And I think because I've got those skills, and like I say, I think women do block themselves, slow. oh, I can't go and ask for work, that's like begging, you know what I mean? Ooh, yeah, I'm gonna go and ask for work, because I haven't got any, you know what I mean? I, th I think you've got to do that. I mean, it's like an institution like Fabric, you know, who hardly book me, and when they do, they want me not to work in London for three months around it. I'm like, hang on a minute, Fabric. I'm a prostitute of music. I can, I can play it wherever I like, you know, at the end of the day. You don't dictate to me where I'm playing. I don't, I, I really don't like that attitude. And it's most probably why I don't get booked there anymore, you know. But at the end of the day, I've done my time in Fabric and I've played there. I've ticked the box. And yes, it would be nice to play there. But, you know, because I found it interesting them doing the Smirnoff kind of thing that they tried to do with the women. And... It felt a little bit contrived. You know, number one, Smirnoff wants to sell alcohol to you at the end of the day. And I kind of had to ask the question of fabric. They were asking all these questions about outing festivals and saying, you've only got this percentage. So I emailed them and I said, well, after 18 years, what's your percentage? I said, because you're not making that clear. And I know I was one of the only females that worked in fabric. You certainly, I think only metalheads, you ha were able to have two of us on the lineup. Because there's the other thing that's difficult for women. Why will they only let one through? You know, they won't, you know, there's not two on the, why can't you have two on the lineup? You know what I mean? Why, you know, and, and then you get precious about saying all female lineup. Well, it is an all male lineup normally, but we don't worry about, we don't have to say that. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, uh, as women, we have to, I'm not sure what the answer is sometimes, but I know for me, just like reaching out to people, old promoters, new promoters, and again, you know, maybe I hadn't done my homework for a bit, you know what I mean? And I really needed to get on it, but there was never a thought of doing anything else, no. I just had to kind of work hard and, you know, kind of, yeah, go back to basics. I think sometimes you have to go back to basics and as long as you feel like you've still got the goods and you can still do the job, then I think to a certain extent, you've just got to push, push, push. And I, I, that's what I did for a while. And I, yeah, and, it, and I think my agent was really noticing that, that I was getting more work for myself than they were. So that course doesn't go through their books. And I had to say that to my agent, if I'm getting all this work, I'm not then gonna turn it over to you for 15% when I've made the deal, book the flight, whatever else. So that's why I think it made him, and because he lost a few people in a very short space of time, and he is a good guy, you know what I mean? I think he does respect my loyalty. You know, I mean, he sent, he sent me some flowers the other day, a bottle of wine and a box of chocolates and saying, do you realize it's 20 years today since you came to the agency? And because I've turned it round, he respects me now. And I'm one of the only ones on, you know, I made a deal with him a long time ago saying, look, I'm getting smaller work now. I can't, I can't give you that 15%, do you know what I mean? So we made a deal of a top line of money and all the other guys were like, how is he doing that with you? And I said, because I'm not screaming and shouting at him. I'm just talking to him. Whereas you'll come on the phone and say, where's my effing work? I don't deal with him like that. I say, Mark, we need to have a serious chat. You know what I mean? And because I moved out of home a few years ago to look after my mother, I wasn't face to face with him, which I would have loved to have done that. Do you know what I mean? But we had to have a serious chat on the phone. And because he still wanted to keep me, uh, we made it work, you know? But you have to... And it's, it's like, I remember me and Kemi after, our, like I say, we had innovation. This was our first residency and we'd been there for a few months. And you, we got 25 quid 
that was our wages. And after about three months, we were like, do you think we can ask like, to go up to like, you know, 30? And, you know, we were like, what if he doesn't book us anymore? Do you know what I mean? So, but we had, you know, and it, we felt, oh, my God, it's going to take a lot for us to say this. Do you know what I mean? But because of the way we approached the guy, we, got, we actually got 40. So we were really excited now. You know what I mean? We'd actually got more than we thought. And I think, again, there's certain ways to approach things. And I think, yeah, I mean, you know, we say there's competition for the ladies, but, God, there's competition between the guys as well. You know, I mean... How many more people have come in the last year? You know, when I think about how many people that Kemi reached, you think about, you know, what she'd been passed away 17 years when Marcus passed, how many more people he'd reached, you know, and how many more territories he'd traveled to. And, you know, I mean, I think for us, because of K7, we actually, the album, we actually got to places that most probably people wouldn't have got to in, in, in that time of their careers. We were very, I mean, and why K7 picked us? Don't know. But they hunted us down for two years, and that was amazing, you know what I mean? And people say it's, you know, these are not my words, people say it's one of the best drum and bass mixes of all time. And I, when I go back and listen to it, I think, yeah, God, we worked really hard on that. You know what I mean? And it was the first time that we played each other's tunes, you know, and because we had to. We couldn't do a run of things without, you know, we'd, Kemi would get to a certain point. We're like, oh, okay, well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to use one of my tunes that's gonna fit in there. So, you know, if anybody can tell me, you know, uh, who's doing what in K7 mix, I'll give you a copy. I've got about 10 at home, do you know what I mean? So if you ever wanna email me that, <laughs> or hit me up on Messenger. <laughs> well, I mean, all of that in the end gave you a reign as a first lady of this genre longer than Angela Merkel's, which is probably... <laughs> All controversial. She's a nice lady, right? <laughs> she does a hell of a job. And I don't want to have a job. I yeah, that exactly, exactly. A poor Theresa May. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, I suppose it does come with responsibility as well. And I do, you know, I was having this conversation for the Red Bull thing, you know, and the lady was saying to me, oh, you know, you've always helped the females, you know, you've always tried to encourage them. And of course, I said, yeah, but I do do that for guys too. I've never gone, oh, well, because you're a female, I have to help you, you know, but normally, obviously, females feel that they can approach me. And that's great. I'm glad that they feel I'm open to talk to because I'll try and encourage you as much as I can. Do you know what I mean? And I will, obviously, because I know it's a tougher road, you know, I will, of course, encourage you to, you know, and try and help you as much as I can. You know, I did the novelty but normal thing <laughs> in Leeds for Red Bull and, um, yeah, met some lovely girls up there and people have already started sending me mixes, so that's great. And, I mean, one girl had a plan. She's going to go on a cruise ship for two years, you know, earn some money. She's taking her decks with her. She's going to get her mixing skills together. And the, the first year there, she's just going to get her skills together. Then she's going to start sending out mixes. And you know, so hopefully by the time she's come back from the cruise, she can start getting work. I was like, well, you see, you have a plan. You know, you want it. You're seeing ahead. That's the way to do it. You need to go a few steps ahead of yourself for guys or girls that, that can work. And I think if you, I think women plan. You know what I mean? We definitely, you know, and I mean, Kemi and I did, for sure. We definitely tried to plan a few steps ahead. But I suppose for us, again, Metalheads, Goldie, Timeless, Reinforce, we did have a few advantages that other people didn't, you know? So I can't say it was all down to us. But again, I mean, even with Metalheads, when it first started, I couldn't, I couldn't book us every time. You know what I mean? You know, I see that happening a lot more with labels where the label manager will book themselves, you know? I, I couldn't do that. You know what I mean? I, I very much did hierarchy lineups when it came to Blue Notes. So Chemistry and Storm for Metalheads were the warm-up for quite a long time because we had other DJs who were our peers who needed to be part of that. You know, that was who were playing this stuff. Dot Scott, Randall, Groove Rider, Fabio, they were above us, you know what I mean? Pesce, Lee, all these kind of people who were first there at Blue Note. But that was interesting as well, doing lineups, and I realized I've got a skill for that as well. So that was great. That worked hand in hand with Metalheads. You know, I was able to do the lineups really easy. I did Goldie's first Metalheads tour. And I mean, we were again lucky, like London Records gave us their mailing list. They wanted our mailing list, and we were like, okay. Yeah. And they were like, oh, you can have ours. Oh, thank you. You know, and that was invaluable to us. You know, who knew that was going to happen? And Obviously, people at the time were having problems being signed because the scene felt like they were letting them down. So Goldie was like, I don't want to let the scene down. I want my 
girls to come in and meet Pete Tong and all the people at London Records who are doing my promotion because I want them to have it first. So we had his album for, I think it was four months we had his album before London took it on and we went into this big meeting at London Records and the, there were people with books and pens writing things down that we said. We were like, I don't know, you know, like, <laughs> we don't know, we're just doing what we do, you know what I mean? And again, of course, that clever move that Goldie made giving them metalheads with an S and we were metalheads with a Z. It was a brilliant thing to do because everybody thought we were just one big company and all those things would come through our door. And, you know, next minute Lawrence Fishman wanted stuff for his movie and then we had beer commercials and all kinds of things, you know, that other labels didn't have. So in one respect, yes, we were a novelty and we were the first female duo to come out of it. But we had a lot of things that happened by fate, I suppose, by, by I, I suppose, meeting Goldie. You know, that, that, that was a game changer for us and I'll always give him that, do you know what I mean? And I think, to a certain extent, watching him in action, he was like, you know, it's like the dub plate thing. He thought, you know, you could go... So first of all, he embarrasses us with Reinforced, yeah? And then he takes the dub plate to Groove Rider and comes back and says, oh, Groove Rider was really angry with me. And we were like, oh no, what have you done? He said, well, I took the dub plate to him to play and I was take it back. You know, you t it's what you like a sound system, right? You take... And I said, and what did Groove Rider say to you? He said, he said, like that on the dub plate, that's mine now. I played it, that's mine now. Yeah, you go and cut another one, young man. You know, yeah, but I haven't got much money. Well, that's your fault. You know what I mean? That's, you know, we were like, oh, God, dear, you're mortifying. Do you know what I mean? We, Groove Rider's just, <laughs> you know. But, you know, he thought that's what you did. You know what I mean? Like a reggae system would take it. You know, he was like, well, that's what you do in reggae. We said, yeah, yeah, this is drum and bass. Once the DJs touched that and played it, that's theirs, yeah. 25 quid, he was like, I was like, yeah, you better get your money out, do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, speaking of planning and scheduling, um, as you can see, the lady's very approachable and will stick around for a bit, but our schedule is actually moving on very soon, so we're going to have another conversation here starting in 10 minutes or so. So um, we would like to give you everyone a break, but not without giving a very, very big hand to Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs>